Thanks very much. Um, so, good morning everybody, or technically maybe it's good afternoon. Um, I'm Andrew Cooper. Um, I'm one of the founders of the Centre for Social Work Practice, and I also work at the Tavistock Centre in London, where I'm Professor of Social Work. Um, my talk this morning is called Holding It Together Despite It All, and listening to uh, Jadwiga in particular um, was pause for reflection for me, as she mentioned at the start of her talk, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, I did a lot of research in Europe um, looking at child protection systems and child protection practices in many different European countries and comparing them, along with lots of colleagues here and abroad, uh, to our way of doing things um, in England, uh, England and Wales, um, because we took Scotland as a different model, a different country. And that work um, brought me and my colleagues back really, with a lot of reforming zeal in relation to the English system. And I was thinking, I wondered if a bit of this uh, in the subsequent sort of 15 years had started to drain out of me. Um, I mean, the, the kind of spirit of Jad's talk was very much the spirit that we came back with, which was, look, things can really be different if only we can think differently and have a different uh, kind of mindset about... Um, well, this work and how it could be conducted. I mean, my talk today begins from a different kind of position, I think, which is more um, a look at the, uh, you know, my own account, really, of the kind of um, the realities we struggle with in contemporary England as social workers um, and some of the struggles this creates and some of the dilemmas it creates and then, so the first part of the talk is perhaps a bit, you know, on the depressing side, but I move to a more hopeful message later on, which is really about how we can uh, creatively adapt um, to some of the kind of constraining forces that do exist for practitioners and organisations uh, in today's environment. So, to get going, I think when times are hard... Um, and there's not enough to go round, or at least we're told there isn't enough to go round, we can fight amongst ourselves, we can compete, we can fragment, and we can blame. Austerity, and now I think Brexit, are you know, major environmental, contextual factors that you know, lead to a sense and to a reality that there isn't enough to go round. These are part of the conditions we're living in. But in the face of these kinds of forces, uh, we might succeed in forging some solidarity. But even this might involve um, us in a kind of us-against-them dynamic. I mean, how we achieve and maintain solidarity, the very thing that Sharon was trying to evoke, uh, I think, in her talk, is part of my theme. So the questions arise, if we think there is a struggle and we need to maintain solidarity, well, who are the real opposition? And I think we need to ask ourselves, is there a strong position somewhere between sort of fight and flight, between um, <coughs> protest and uh, contestation um, and helplessness, between, you know, compliance and protest, between passivity and rebellion, helplessness and hopelessness, and... I found myself thinking in, in the sort of anxiety following the Brexit result, I found in myself a sort of desire for a strong leader, you know, someone to get us out of this mess, please, anybody. I ran into a colleague in the toilets at the Tavistock, it's the only place I ever see him to have a chat, and he said to me, he said, my God, what's going on? Um, he said, you know, I find myself uh, thinking, what a great person Theresa May is. And I said, I said, I... <laughs> I have exactly the same thought, and, and, and this is, you know, anybody, please, who looks credible to get us out of this mess. So a desire for a strong leader has to be resisted, but it's where we go in circumstances or conditions uh, or in states of anxiety, I think. So holding it together uh, isn't easy. So I want just to evoke something about uh, what I call, slightly ironically, the New Deal that we're living with in this country now. 
Uh, it's familiar, really, I think, to us all. It's a low-tax, uh, low-welfare economy. Um, but the question is, you know, who's paying for this, really, and how are we paying for this new deal that has been introduced uh, via um, austerity measures? And I think the answer is that just about everyone in this room and our patients or service users, our colleagues, our children, uh, ourselves as parents, uh, we're all paying for this in various ways. So I think people with disabilities are paying, children and adults with mental health problems. When we look at uh, the reports coming out about the state of you know, child mental health services, adult mental health services, vulnerable children, children in need and at risk, asylum seekers, immigrants, older people needing social care, people working on low incomes, including many social care staff. The NHS is paying. Um, the health and caring professions are paying. Local authority services are paying as they are increasingly uh, under the cosh, really, financially outsourcing their services with radical consequences. And the third sector itself, um, where many of the solutions are sometimes felt to lie in the increasingly you know, difficult conditions inside the statutory sector, the third sector is paying as well. So after Brexit, um, holding it together, I think, is extremely difficult. And I mean sort of in our own minds and in our own way of relating to the world and to each other. I mean, I was watching two Labour politicians on Newsnight the other night um, flanking, uh, what's his name, Evan Davis. Uh, one who was identified with the kind of Corbyn position and the other with the Parliamentary Labour Party. And Evan Davis said, uh, well, we've agreed that you're not going to fight. Um, and I was thinking, how can they not fight? It's an impossible situation. You know, the Labour Party and the Labour movement finds itself in this appallingly difficult situation which has been exposed with um, MPs feeling that they are mandated by their constituents, by the people who voted for them, and that they have got a responsibility uh, towards the country in terms of um, creating sort of a, a, you know, a, a viable possibility of re-election and that they need a leadership um, that can achieve that. And the movement that supported and uh, underpinned Jeremy Corbyn's um, election as leader feeling, look, we have a mandate as well. And it's a difficult conflict, actually, that the party and the, the, the whole movement finds itself in. The really difficult thing is how on earth you do um, create uh, circumstances in which you can hold it together under those circumstances rather than end up with a split. And I'm going to be emphasising quite a bit something about a capacity to think and keep on thinking at both a political and a professional and a practitioner level under these very difficult circumstances of conflict and anxiety. So I think that one of the consequences of the the Brexit result, whatever you individually may feel about it, however you voted, is that something of a sort of veneer of civilization has been stripped away in this uh, nation. Some of the conditions that provided political containment, or it may have been a kind of illusion of containment, have been fractured. And so deep divisions in our society that have been there uh, for a long time, gradually accreting in various ways, are more exposed. Um, and their toxic potential threatens to be unleashed or is already being unleashed. And so, um, and this is a quote from um, a writer called Yvonne Roberts in The Guardian. It's just one I found which I thought was pertinent. She says, events such as a referendum put tolerance to the test. Um, she's quoting there from political psychologist uh, Teresa Capelos. Ironically, tolerance begins from a negative starting point. You have an intention to share benefits with others even when you don't like them. Everybody dislikes somebody, but if you believe that others have rights and you engage in a society which is open, you accept this. If you feel marginalised, you may have weaker civic values. 
a spark can encourage you to see another human being as the other. You dehumanise him or her. They are not like us. Some on the margins of society feel betrayed and don't know who has betrayed them, so they turn on the other. That's why politicians, journalists and academics have such a responsibility for the narratives they develop, and this very much evokes the points that Sharon was making, I think, about the narratives that have been developed about social work, which in a sense has created us as a kind of dangerous other who can be scapegoated and blamed. She was arguing very much for the need to push back against that. But we are in circumstances where these narratives are flying about um, and they, they catch us as individuals and they catch whole populations and subpopulations at a profoundly sort of emotional and rather primitive level and this mobilises divisions if we're not very careful. So the importance of thinking, um, as I've said, these divisions and the associated toxicity of them are directly relevant to us as social workers in our daily lives and our experiences with each other, with our service users. So the idea of being able to think under fire um, is one that we use particularly at the Tavistock. It derives from the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion, whose thinking we use a great deal in trying to help social workers. Um, for him, it actually derived from having been a tank commander in the First World War and surviving and uh, reflecting back upon how he emotionally and mentally survived the stresses of those kinds of experiences. But there's something about thinking under fire which involves first opening yourself to the emotional experience, whether it's an experience in practice um, with service users or whether it's a political experience or an organisational experience, and allowing yourself to really know it. Um, know it in a way that is rooted in emotional experience. Then allowing yourself time to assimilate its complexity and its perturbing impact upon you. And then enabling yourself in some way to find some thoughts that seem to capture the experience in a truthful way. Some words that might help you articulate and give truthful and accurate representation uh, to whatever it is. And once you've found some words, <clears throat> you may have the basis <coughs> for making some sense of experience. And speaking them may be a way of changing things for yourself and for others. Because when we're inhabited by anxiety and uncertainty and conflict, um, the thing we're most easily impelled towards is action, <clears throat> but rather thoughtless um, or mindless action. Action may be needed, but it needs to be mindful and based, I think, on a kind of um, properly deep, reflective appreciation of the experiences that are driving us towards action. So, to go back to this question of how I think we're paying at the moment for um, the political circumstances that we find ourselves in. So this is a short story that was written by um, an experienced um, social work practitioner on a post-qualifying program um, um, at the Tavistock. Uh, she just wrote it in a reflective commentary. She says, as I go into supervision, I'm filled with dread as I know my to-do list is not even a quarter complete. All my manager is interested in is our timescales met, our plans completed and up to date, our core groups up to date, our core assessments completed, rather than asking me how I am and how are or who are the children on my caseload. He gets out my caseload list and asks me what cases can close. I respond saying none of them, and he tells me there must be. I try to explain why, and he responds that he has to get caseloads down, and that we just cannot keep hanging on to cases. This starts to increase my stress levels as I feel that more work is needed on my cases, more support required to meet the family's required needs. Supervision carries on in this manner, going through each case briefly, recording timescales, and my manager telling me when assessments must be completed by so the case can close. I feel that all my manager cares about is getting cases closed and timescales, which irritates me as I know that if they are closed, they will soon be re-referred 
as the issues have not been addressed effect, efficient, efficiently. I just wish I could be allowed to do my job effectively. After work, I quickly pop by the supermarket to get some food shopping, and at the checkout, I feel like it's being in supervision. Everything is rush, rush, rush. I take everything out of my trolley and place it on the conveyor belt. This is done in no particular order, as I can see the checkout lady looking at me, which makes me speed up. She is passing the items through at a fast pace, faster than I can bag them, and I ask her to slow down, but this is ignored. As soon as she has finished scanning them, she immediately asks for payment, even though I've not bagged all the items yet. I make her wait, and I can see her getting agitated, whilst I feel myself getting flustered and annoyed as I rush to bag the items and pay. After I pay, before I leave the checkout, I notice that she is already scanning the next customer's items. Surely she could have waited another 30 seconds to give me time to leave, I think to myself. Well, so what's being evoked here, I think, in a way, it's self-evident. You can see for yourself. I, I don't think this practitioner was recounting this story in a spirit of blame, although there's anger and irritation built into it, but not in a spirit of really blaming her manager or blaming the checkout assistant, but really evoking an experience to try to convey something, communicate something, make sense of something about this funny relationship between um, uh, you know, an experience um, in a supermarket where um, commercial pressures are operating on her and on the checkout lady, and indeed her experience in supervision where similarly sort of commercially derived pressures are operating on the whole uh, social care organisational system. So, one way we're paying, which this story tries to illustrate, we're paying with the emergence in our organisations and our services of a kind of industrial efficiency model of service organisation and delivery. And again, we saw some sort of a different kind of evidence for that in Jad's presentation when we see the kind of workstation call centre model uh, that I suspect all of you are becoming more familiar with. Um, some people want to claim that this improves working practices and other people have a, a quite different experience of it, I think. Well, about ten years ago, I wrote a book uh, with a colleague. Uh, it was called Borderline Welfare, Feeling and Fear of Feeling in Modern Welfare. And this book described how um, the quality of our services was becoming thinner and more proceduralized as um, inspection, audit, and performance management regimes and risk aversion moved into the space once occupy, occupied by professional autonomy and discretion. And the book tried to develop the idea of the health service and the welfare state in general as a, a necessary social container uh, for the adversity, suffering, conflict, mental pain of citizens. Services provide a response to people in need but also protect the rest of the population from too much anxiety and responsibility for the complexities um, of undertaking care and the needs of people who we respond to. Um, but a real container is receptive uh, to suffering and mental pain um, and family conflict. And it shapes itself around these experiences. And in that way, the contained, that is, the, the problematic situations we deal with, the distress that we encounter as professionals, changes the nature of the container. It, if we let it impact upon us, professionally, at an individual level, organisationally, in our teams, then it kind of changes the nature of the container. And again, there was something in the evocation of the Flemish model of child welfare and child protection services that uh, fits with this, I think. What, what we were looking at there, which I didn't have time to go into it in great detail, I think, was a kind of mainstream therapeutically oriented service that takes risk to children and family conflict very seriously, but is prepared really to engage with it um, and to think with it. She talked about power with rather than power against it's also about thinking with um, 
these experiences um, and thinking on the basis of having absorbed and really taken in something of what it's like to be this child or be in this family and having organisational conditions and support that enables that. So one clinical theorist described two alternatives to a sort of concave or receptive container. She described a flat surface that doesn't let much in at all. Or indeed she described also the idea of a convex one which kind of actively pushes the pain and need back into the subject. My question, in a way, is well, what kind of social container do we think our health, welfare, children's, adults, services in the UK now provide or offer? So I think that some of the ways we're paying under contemporary circumstances are these. We are paying in ourselves, I think, with our professional and personal integrity. I wonder who in this room sometimes thinks that their sort of true professional self, I mean the self that came into the job to do good relationship-based helping work with people, you know, has to kind of stay in hiding these days um, in order to get the, the job done in the way that the organisation needs, seems to need us to get it done. I think we're paying with our own mental health I wonder who in this room has been off work with stress or been close to it or has a close colleague who has been off or who has resigned and moved on in the hope of finding something better or lives in some fear of redundancy. I think these are common contextual background conditions for us. I think we're paying actually with the quality of our services and with our knowledge that they are in many instances being compromised. And so the quality of our own organisations and I think systemic deterioration in relationships between frontline staff and managers is another way in which we're paying. So when the practitioner tells the story about supervision and evokes this picture of her manager, I think she's trying very hard not to create an us and them blaming account, but it's latent in there. Um, the point being really that the manager is also under extraordinary pressure uh, within his or her own organisation um, to enact um, and fulfil and meet you know, the performance agenda, the inspection agenda and so forth. We're all caught um, in, the, in these difficulties. Holding it together is, you know, again to evoke a theme that's been prominent already this morning, is trying not to blame but to understand and make sense of things as a basis on which we might start to try to act to change things. So why is all this happening? Uh, well, maybe it's to pay for austerity. Maybe it's to keep certain people in power. Maybe it's to open the way for privatisation in health and welfare services. Maybe all those three things are linked. I fear in some ways that, um, without, create, without offering a very sophisticated analysis of this, that all this is happening partly to create and maintain a society that is divided but is still politically manageable. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, Britain isn't yet the United States, but this is how one American commentator sees the contemporary United States. So this is David Simon, who is the originator and uh, writer of the famous <coughs> TV programme The Wire, which some of you may know, um, a long, complex, sort of Shakespearean contemporary drama about uh, the lives of disadvantaged people in Baltimore, in the States, and the politicians who try to manage the city and the police force. Um, compelling stuff if you haven't watched it. Uh, and here he's trying to say, well, what this program was about. And he says, that's what The Wire was about, basically. It was about people who were worthless and who were no longer necessary. As maybe 10 or 15% of my country is no longer necessary to the operation of the economy. 
It was about them, these people, trying to solve, for lack of a better term, an existential crisis. In their irrelevance, their economic irrelevance, they were nonetheless still on the ground, occupying this place called Baltimore, and they were going to have to endure somehow. That's the great horror show. What are we going to do with all these people that we've managed to marginalise? And I put this in front of us because my fear is that this is what is happening in this country and that this has been roughly the strategy of governments in recent years to quite consciously really create a more divided society where disabled people, people on benefits, people unemployed um, are not cared about, um, they're not looked after, they're not going to be supported um, and there's no intention really um, of creating this more unified, caring, compassionate society because um, taking away from that, that sector of the population is part of the way in which government has decided to solve the economic problems of the country. Now, that's a stark view. I fear it's accurate. The 10 or 15% that David Simon evokes in The Wire has, it, has a corresponding, um, uh, you know, has a correspondence here in Britain, I think, and this 10 or 15% of the population, you know, obviously do make up a significant proportion of the people who we in social care and social work actually work with. So, uh, at one level, I'm not optimistic. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do what I was evoking. I'm trying to evoke something that's painful and difficult, possibly controversial, because I think it's true and real, and I think it's part of what we um, are trying to deal with. So, under all these circumstances, it seems to me that you know, social work practice in statutory organisations increasingly... Um, finds itself operating in what I think of as kind of constricted spaces. So the space is kind of defined on the one hand by statute and policy and statutory guidance and the sort of potency, the power of these concepts of risk and vulnerability, which have meaning um, but are surrounded by so much anxiety uh, and the background fear of kind of blame if we fail to protect people. That's one very, very important sort of uh, boundary constraint okay, on the practice space. And then we've got our service users and carers, and then there's us as professionals. And increasingly, I think that child protection, adult safeguarding, fostering and adoption, end-of-life care, many other uh, specialised sectors are sort of bounded in this rather constricted way. I think that um, there could be the possibility of creating more open spaces. Uh, I mean, again, a, a social structure and a set of social arrangements that are more like those that Jadwiga evoked um, as the context in Flanders. So where um, we've got, you know, impoverished and marginalised, perhaps invisible, undocumented, scapegoated populations and communities who we are trying to provide a social response to. Uh, we've got social work and social care. And we've got the support of new social movements and anti-austerity campaigns. The possibility of reclaiming a different kind of social work is still present, but we do have to grasp it. We have to decide um, individually, collectively, that we want to push for, campaign for, have a voice in relation to the possibility of this. Now, how this comes back to our lived experience is that, you see, social workers know about the lived experience of relatively invisible, marginalised and impoverished populations. But we need some sort of movement to support us as practitioners, to protect us as well if we are to advocate and campaign on the basis of the knowledge we have of the kind of suffering that children are enduring in this country, children with mental health problems, children who are vulnerable, 
asylum seekers, refugees, disabled people, and so forth. We know all about this. Um, and yet, do we uh, really find a voice politically or professionally? And do we have organizations that can give us a voice, that provide us with leadership to make use of this knowledge that we have? I also ask myself, do we have the energy, you know, to engage in this kind of additional campaigning? I mean, I see a couple of people shaking their heads. I sometimes think that the reason why we're all made to work so hard is that we have no surplus energy left to do any protesting. Um, and that that's a kind of uh, invisible conspiracy, but I'll leave you to think about that. But there are, and what I want to go on to do is to evoke the possibility of sort of much more hopeful practitioner possibilities, practice possibilities, because they do exist. Uh, people who are finding, um, they, they can make, if they can find the energy and the creativity and the support, they can make use of these rather more constricted conditions to keep relationship-based practice and creative practice alive. One example of this, which many of you may have heard of is, is the family drug and alcohol courts model in this country, which does owe its origins a little bit to some of the work that I and my colleagues did do in Europe, where um, family courts operate very, very differently to how family courts operate here. They operate in a much more negotiative, relationship-based manner. This is true in Flanders and in other communities in Belgium, it's true in France and Italy, many of the southern European countries, but also in Germany in different ways. Uh, when families come into the kind of statutory arena in other European countries, it's not like, it's a different kind of transition from the one that occurs here in Britain. It's into a space that does have state authority, judicial authority involved, but um, judges are working in a much more sort of symbolically subtle and relationship-based manner. And families find it much more supportive, much less threatening, um, and quite often in certain countries even are beating a path to the door of statutory services saying we want supervi the supervision order renewed because we found it so helpful, a kind of unthinkable thing in Britain. So family drug and alcohol courts, which... Um, have been successfully trialled in this country, very positively evaluated, and the last I heard were on the point of being rolled out across this country, although I think the funding for them may have uh, been withdrawn now, I'm not quite sure of the situation. They work on this model. They are quite tightly bounded. There's the family court judge, there's the multidisciplinary team working alongside the judge in a proper sort of contractual dialogue with families to create something called a trial for change that really gives parents and carers an opportunity to demonstrate they can change, that, 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 that they are capable of resuming the care of their children uh, with a program of therapeutic help that is time limited. It's goal-defined and time-limited therapeutic work bounded by a collaborative agreement amongst all three parties. So it's an interesting, therapeutically informed, um, judicially bounded model that is, I think, hopeful. I'm wondering about time. Um, I'm going to skip some of this, actually, because I don't have time. <coughs> I mean, this was my sort of evocation of the idea of our professional selves having gone into hiding. <coughs> I mean, over on the right-hand side, <coughs> down the bottom, I think we all as practitioners in our engagements with our service users, you know, we carry around in ourselves fears for the well-being of our the children we're responsible for, the adults we're responsible for working with, and we have fears about whether what we're doing with them is helpful or, or possibly harmful. Uh, I mean, is it the right thing 
to remove these children from their parents. These are agonizing decisions, and we really do, and I think should, question ourselves all the time. You know, am I doing harm here at the same time as I believe I'm doing good? These, these fears are around all the time, and they're kind of, they come with the territory of being a sensitized, engaged practitioner. And they're normal, I think. But I think alongside these, intersecting with them, of course, we all now carry fears for the survival of our professional selves. Because of being under scrutiny for our own performance, because of our organizations being under scrutiny, because of the fear of what the next inspection report might say and what the consequences for our jobs might be. So at the same time as we're concerned about um, and have anxieties about our direct work with service users, the kinds of anxieties that, for those who are familiar with it, Isabel Menzies Lyth evoked in her famous paper 50 or more years ago now about how social defences arise in organisations to protect staff against the anxieties of the primary task. We've got these other kinds of fears that are more about, less about us worrying about, you know, whether we've done good or harm to our service users, but what's the good or harm that might be done to us? And these things get mixed up together. So this latter form of anxiety, perform, performance and survival related, <coughs> we call in the jargon, the sort of psychoanalytic jargon, persecutory anxiety. Are they out to get me? Am I safe? Uh, will I survive? And these are... Um, these intersect with task-related anxiety. You know, did I make the right decision for this child or this adult? Uh, am I doing the right thing in intervening in this very complicated situation in the way that I am? All these anxieties um, threaten, in a way, to kind of mask, because I think, don't think we get enough help with understanding them, um, what I call the true professional self, which is kind of hidden behind those boxes on the left, um, the reparative desire, the desire to be helpful, even though that is a complex task, um, goes into hiding, really, because the demands of the organisation to just hit the ground running, get on with it, uh, and deliver on the caseloads become so predominant. Now, I've sort of examined this particular complicated intersection between different kinds of anxiety uh, with the help of a colleague um, who did some research. It was her doctoral research. In fact, she went into and did a kind of ethnographic study of um, several frontline teams in social work. And she, w she was interested to know whether... Um, Isabel Menzies Lyth's original ideas about the way that organizations develop systems of social defense to protect people against the anxiety of the, of the task, whether it be social care or nursing, whether these kinds of anxieties still exist and have they been replaced by new ones. And she discovered, really, that she thought there were new kinds of anxieties <coughs> operating in organizations. Um, and one of them she called spotlighting. And she quotes here, from a, a practitioner who says, why is that system in place that three people need to check it? I don't understand. Isn't someone competent, competent enough to be able to check that report once, sign it and send it off? Because it's making the whole process even longer than it needs to be. Because ideally, you'd want your court work done, in, done a week before. It's impossible. And this social worker is evoking a culture in an office in which nobody feels confident enough uh, to take the authority to sign off a report. It's passed up to a manager, it's passed up to another manager. Everybody's anxiously checking for, you know, uh, checking the quality of the report because everyone's anxious about the consequences if something's wrong or some criticism occurs when it's presented in court. And you say, what's going on here? We have to ask the question. So uh, Amanda Lees, who did this work, says, you know, these defences 
resonated with a number of those identified by Isabel Menzies Lithe regarding decision making and checking with seniors which also had a kind of obsessional aspect to them. So taken together they represent socially structured defences against anxieties about carrying out important and risky work in contexts characterised by lack of time, resource and characterised by complexity and ambiguity but importantly also in the shadow of an omnipresent inspectorial management system in the mind that was not the sole product of anxieties coming from the task, but was a product of anxieties filtering down through the organisation from the external political environment represented perhaps by Ofsted. So these are the, these are the difficult subjective conditions in our work that I think arise in the contemporary period. However, some more signs of hope. I want to talk here about um, a practitioner who um, has been doing her professional doctorate at the Tavistock, really writing up and conceptualising a piece of work um, that she's done over a number of years in one local authority. So I just evoke it here in sort of story form. So in an East London children's centre, a psychoanalytically trained social worker welcomes a dozen children who arrive in various groupings with their foster carers. The children are members of three sibling groups, all of them in local authority care and in the process of being adopted or placed in long-term foster care. Now, the adoption worker had noticed something which no one else had registered, that large sibling groups, when they come into care, are routinely split up when they enter the system. And then planning for the futures of these subgroups proceeds on separate lines. Professionals, social workers, actually forget the wider sibling system and cease to consider its meaning from the child's point of view. So this worker decided that she would, she's a trained play therapist as well, that she would convene um, six-week-long therapeutic groups uh, for, um, in each case, a number of different sibling groups of children bringing back these sort of fragmented subgroups into connection with one another so that they could refine each other, <coughs> um, develop or redevelop connections before actually often saying goodbye to one another as they did go off into different <coughs> forms of permanency. But they would now be saying goodbye in the context of a, of a, a social work system, an organisational system, and also a family system, a sibling system, that remembers their relationships and will enable future contact. So this was actually an original and innovative thing to do. Um, sometimes the work she did in these groups over the period of six weeks led her to see that the decisions that had been made, she thought, were entirely wrong. Um, or mistaken and so she started uh, contesting these decisions with her manager and sometimes decisions would be changed because there had been a kind of mindlessness in the, in the functioning of the overall system in relation to the individual children so revised permane permanency decisions were one consequence now this work was actually rather fiercely resisted at first by her managers uh, by judges as well and by children's guardians they all voiced a similar reaction, that this process that she was engaging in was much too painful for these children and would harm them. But she actually won them round uh, and kind of had to help them discover that this response was mostly about the pain evoked in them um, at the prospect of you know, these meetings and mournings amongst these children. So this worker... Um, is actually, I think, doing something more than just advocating in a creative way for the needs of a specific group of disadvantaged children. She's doing the work of what's called a boundary spanner. She's kind of conveying you know, thickly textured understanding and emotional intelligence about these children from one domain, her groups, to another, the organisation, the courts, uh, Kafkas, and... She's doing that in search of a more sort of attuned and grounded policy response 
in these systems that's rooted in authentic recognition of the lived experience of these children. So she's doing something that I tried to, uh, I started to speak about earlier. She's insisting that local policy processes and perhaps eventually national ones must begin um, from such understanding of you know, the lived realities of the people we're trying to help and whose circumstances we're trying to support. And policy has to shape itself around these complex realities and look for solutions that are negotiated between these different domains and systems. She's asking that the social container relate to and incorporate and digest and take in the quality of experience of the populations that it's supposed to be there to respond to before it makes a policy response. So that's one way in which, um, you know, a worker found the creativity to sort of push back against forces in the system that seemed to her to be actively damaging to the service users, the children she cared about. So uh, this is a different kind of story. Uh, in which, but, but what it illustrates, I think, again, is the possibility that if you can think in this sort of deep, deeply grounded way, then it is possible to do creative work under very pressurised circumstances. The background to this story is this. This children and families practitioner um, working in um, a frontline service goes into work one morning and she's grabbed by her manager who says, look, a referral has just come in from the local hospital, um, from, the, um, from the health team there, um, there's a baby who's just been born with um, quite a severe disability and uh, the mother seems a little bit unresponsive and the father is very, very angry indeed. And so they phoned us. I want you to go out now um, and um, uh, go to the hospital, make an assessment and go and meet this father and I want you to take someone with you to see the father. So this is five past nine in the morning, she's already got her day planned. She's kind of suddenly gripped by, you know, the anxiety of the manager in response to an anxious referral from the hospital. But this is the way this worker wrote about this. She said, I was concerned that an image of this family was being presented to me before I had even had the opportunity to connect with them. I was being invited to be fearful and defensive before I'd even met the family, as if a state of mind that may have belonged to the hospital staff, who had made the referral to the children's service office, was being projected into me. I decided to make contact with the father before the arranged visit, because I felt that if effective work was to take place with this family, an atmosphere of fear and anger needed to be avoided as much as possible. When I phoned father and spoke to him, my impression was of a man who was certainly angry, but also expressed a lot of vulnerability. In my counter-transference, by which I guess she means just her own subjective response to what she was hearing, I didn't feel afraid of this man, but concerned for what the family, including the mother and the two-year-old, that's the um, older child, were going through in this major life-changing trauma. And she says, I think with hindsight, uh, this initial phone call that I made and the feelings that I got from it that contrasted with the feelings I was being invited to have by the hospital professionals, mediated in a way by her own manager, was crucial in developing an effective therapeutic relationship with the family. It was as though I was able to then treat them as a family suffering as opposed to a family on the attack. And they were more able to welcome me into the family as a potential potentially helpful figure. So she goes to the visit on her own. I feel she doesn't need the support of a colleague. But after introducing myself, father asked if I knew what had happened. And by this it became clear that what he meant was how the hospital had let him down and let the family down in them not being informed about the disability of the baby before birth. I th 
the story, I think, was that um, the mother, the hospital had failed to offer the mother a second amniocentesis. And father said, he said, you killed me, you killed my family, we are dead. And from these words, um, the, the worker had the following reaction. She says, at that point, I was clearly part of the system for the father, undifferentiated from the hospital staff, who he felt let down by. And I reflected and acknowledged his anger and said, you seem to be very angry and feel let down by everyone and might wonder if I will let you down too. And she says, this latter part of my comment addressed the man's lack of trust towards me in the transference, in his feeling towards her, in a direct way, which may have helped him feel that at least I was not going to avoid painful and difficult feelings. The sense of unknown was very powerful and included my own feelings of facing the unknown with this family. And I use this to say something about how hard and powerful it is to be suddenly faced with such an unknown painful experience as suddenly having a disabled child. Well, so she gets, she gets things onto a, a workable footing with the father. Off she goes to the hospital. Okay, I've been given a signal about time, and I'm nearly through. Off she goes to the hospital to meet with the multidisciplinary team there. And she says, looking back, the number of hospital staff involved in my various meetings with them was always surprisingly high. The hospital child protection nurse who chaired this first meeting outlined their concerns, and there was particular emphasis on father's verbal violence to hospital staff and his lack of bonding with baby. At the beginning, all the hospital staff spoke with one voice. They were concerned also about mother not visiting during day or staying at night. The idea of the baby being taken into care was put forward as the solution from the very beginning. She says, it was as though the hospital staff had made up their minds about what should happen, and my role would have been to implement their decision. By contrast, I fed back to the meeting my views about the home visit, agreed that the father was clearly very angry, but I thought that such a big decision might be premature for a family who was still at the early stages of coming to terms with, very, with a very traumatic event. I said, we have to give this baby and her family a chance, and that placing the baby even temporarily in care would harm the bonding relation rather than help it. But that challenge to the overriding opinion of the meeting seemed to permit some of the other professionals to break away from the fixed idea that placing the baby in care was the best option, and I received some support for my suggested course of action. We ended the professionals' meeting deciding that there needed to be further assessment and observation of the parents' interaction with the baby, and we agreed to meet again the next day. Well, what then eventuated was that, in fact, the baby went home, um, the worker continued you know, a successful kind of program of uh, sort of, you know, frontline therapeutic work, which was really about grief and mourning. Um, everything calmed down. The baby, stayed, the baby stayed with the family. What can we notice about this? I mean, the worker is under immediate pressure of anxiety from others. But she stays steady. She thinks under fire and she takes her own authority for her own thinking. She receives and contains the father's anger, and she finds words to empathise with him. And she recognises that his response is possibly part of a grief reaction, a response to the loss of something, the idea of a, a healthy new baby. And she meets the anxiety of the hospital system steadily and finds a way to collaborate and that means really to think with them or get them to think with her. And she makes relationships in all directions, and that's what makes the difference. Um, and the point here is, I suppose this is an attempt to kind of tie up some of my themes, is that this is you know, a quite experienced worker, but the capacity that she's developed is this capacity to really think about her experience, to monitor the anxiety that she's subject to, uh, to keep her head, 
her emotional head as much as her intellectual head, um, and, to, and to keep her thinking open and open textured so that there are possibilities um, rather than just single courses of anxiety-driven action. And it made a very big difference in this case that she had these capacities. The case was packed with conflict, charged with anxiety, um, and everyone was impelled towards a particular line of action. And these were the things I was evoking at the beginning, the conditions that are so difficult, both in practice and politically, um, conditions that make it very difficult for us to, quotes, hold it together. So, very simply, under conditions of tension, conflict, we can all fly apart. Or, under conditions of tension and conflict, we can actually move towards each other, move into the space of the other, understand things from their point of view, meet and think together. So I suppose my questions to you, not questions I want you to come up with an answer to necessarily, questions for you to think about. I mean, do you feel you have organisational conditions that help you keep moving towards rather than away from the areas of pain in your work? And how much of a capacity do you feel you have for this in yourself? Do you have help and support with developing these conditions and capacities at work? If you don't, can you ask for them? That's the minimum, perhaps, that we could do for ourselves. And I think that the nature of the primary task that you all engage in is not very different from what it's always been, from when I first came into social work you know, as a practitioner 35 years ago or something. I mean, I listened to cases presented by post-qualifying and qualifying students every day of the week. It's all still recognisable to me, but the conditions in which we operate are different. So I think that this idea of sort of solidarity, togetherness, including thinking together, to me essentially emerges from a capacity to talk about our painful experiences and struggles, from thinking about these things first, before we act, and acting when we know really what it is that we're dealing with. To me, it's kind of that simple and it's that hard. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.